welcome back to the channel. I hope you've been well. In today's video, I thought we would talk a little bit about 10 ways writing a book and starting a business are pretty darn similar. So for a little bit of context, within one year of writing my first book, at the Finer Things Club about living and working in Yellowstone National Park as a young adult, which by the way is turning one tomorrow as of my recording this. Within one year of writing my first book, I became an entrepreneur and discovered that there are a lot more similarities than differences when it comes to writing a book and starting a business. And as someone who's fairly early on in both of those things, I feel like I'm uh, pretty equipped to talk about first impressions and kind of what it looks like. So let's just dive right into it. So the first similarity that I noticed is that that you are creating an experience. You are offering some kind of solution, perspective, approach, whatever, and wrapping it up in a very attractive way for someone. In the case of a book, it's going to be a story format or it's gonna be based on your experience as a professional whatever or as someone who's done X, Y, Z. And as a business owner, you're also talking about not just the perspective approach or solution, but maybe also how to implement it or how to execute on it or customizing some kind of deliverable or product or service or something for someone who really needs it in an attractive way that matches them where they're at. And I think that's the key is you're matching someone where they're at, whether in business or book format. The second similarity is that the hardest part is starting. And to be fair, I think this is true of a lot of things, but I think the hardest part about getting started is that a lot of people face imposter syndrome, especially when writing a book for sure. I definitely can speak more on that because a lot of people with a book idea, especially if it's a memoir of some kind or a business book or you know some kind of nonfiction, something or other, because nonfiction is my jam, the recurring question that sort of rattles around in the back of their mind is going to be, why is it worth writing something like this or doing something like this if a million other people have already written about it or done it? Like, what is so special about me? And the way that I think about this is that it's almost kind of, I'm, you know what? I'm gonna deem this Cinderella syndrome because do you know how many iterations of the classic tale Cinderella there are? There are 10,000 movies. There are 10,000 books, there are 10,000, I don't know, maybe even comics or graphic novels or something. Like there's, there's so many different iterations, but everyone has their favorite. Everyone has their favorite spin on it. And that's almost kind of how I think about it. And your spin is going to be your unique point, like your unique thing that makes you special or that differentiates you or, you know, and, and I'm gonna be getting into this a little bit later, but it could be a quirk in your personality. It could be a habit that you have. It could be the way that you speak literally like your tone or like your pronunciation if you have an accent or something I don't know or it could be the way that you describe something like Carl Sagan was known for communicating extremely complex quantum physics ideas in like super simple formats I don't know if you've heard of like the wormhole thing but to describe what a wormhole was to the average Joe who didn't know astrophysics from squat he literally took a piece of paper folded it in half and shoved a pencil through it and was like that's basically a worm at least to my understanding if i recall correctly that's what he did and that is what made him so special so the hardest part is always going to be getting started with whatever it is that you're doing it doesn't need to be so all or nothing i think it's very okay to play around with it and have fun and experiment the third thing is branding people need to know how they need to think of you and what to expect as a result, in my own words, if I had to describe it. Branding is how you're communicating what you wanna say, the way in which you wanna say it, and who you wanna say it to. People are gonna have their own definitions of branding. That's just mine. Another one is brought up by Alex Hermosi. I don't know if you know who he is, but in case you don't, he's like a business guru dude, and everything that he does is for free, which I think is super cool. That's his unique point. And his definition of branding is considering how or what you wanna be associated with. And I talked about this briefly in another semi-recent video of mine where, you know, if anyone who buys Nike or Under Armour is going to feel like they're an athlete, anyone who buys Gucci is gonna feel like they're super wealthy or something, right? Anyone, like think about, think about Lambos or Lamborghinis. I'm not a car person but I'm, I'm in tune enough to know that anyone who has a sports car like that has a social image of doing extremely well for themselves. So think about the kind of message you're emitting, the type of experience that you're providing, and the feel especially that goes along with either of those things. And for you super data-driven analytical peeps out there, all that stuff is really important because a big part of marketing is branding 
And both of those things have to do with understanding the psychology of your target audience member or of your, of your target client or of whatever target person you are wanting to attract, right? You have to get into their mindset and meet them where they're at, which is why I say that branding is a pretty, I think it's pretty essential to any kind of business or book that you create, right? In the case of a book, it's going to be a book cover. It's going to be, you know, any kind of website like ooh access this book portal like you want there to be consistency in whatever it is you're putting out there the fourth point which i told you i was going to come back to touch on is your unique selling point and i would also say analyzing your competition this is just what makes you special what makes you different and that's a question that you're going to have to ask when you're in business and especially if you're writing a book and especially especially so if you are traditionally publishing that book, if you're wanting to get an agent, if you're wanting to get the big flashy almighty book deal, these are questions that they're going to be asking, which I made a video like a year ago about 10 questions that every aspiring author needs to be able to answer. So if that piques your fancy, you should definitely go check that one out after this video. But think about what is unique about your perspective approach, solution, and or story. And the reason that I say story is because as someone who's written a memoir, that's an extremely important part of your book's marketing and branding and beyond. The memoir, and just for a bit of a refresher in case you don't know, memoir is zeroing in on a very particular time or experience in your life. It's a drop in the ocean that is your life versus a biography, which is like the story of someone's life. An autobiography is you writing the story of your life. So when it comes to memoir, you have to think about what kind of story am I telling and why should anyone care about it, especially if I'm not known outside of my immediate circle. This can also look like doing your research. You're analyzing the competition. You're seeing what the landscape looks like. You're seeing how saturated or undersaturated it is. You're seeing what questions people have that aren't being answered. And this is gonna look different for both business and books. But in the case of books, because I am very knowledgeable in books, this is going to look like researching comp titles. Now there's all kinds of debates on how effective this is or if it's really necessary, but a lot of people have to do this kind of research if they're pursuing a traditional book deal, if they're wanting to work with a press of some kind, um, especially if it's midsize or, or even one of the big five, which is Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, Hachette, Macmillan, and Simon and & Schuster. You're basically seeing what other books are similar to mine out there that have seen success and continue to do well, but aren't necessarily New York Times bestsellers. That's especially important if you're a debut author doing your research. It's pretty ballsy to say that I'm going to compare myself to this recurring New York Times bestselling author because I'm writing a similar book to theirs. It's not really gonna fly if you're doing that kind of research for professionals. Either way, I think it's a good exercise to do, whether you're wanting to write a book or start a business or do both or have one kind of feed into the other. It's just, it's kind of like a 101 type of thing that you have to do research with any kind of new thing that you're tapping into. It's like you wouldn't move to a new town without doing your research on the area, right? I mean, in a perfect world. And lastly, there's also a credibility factor too. If you're gonna start a business, if you're gonna write a book, especially if it's nonfiction, you have to think about why are you the one to do it? Why, why is it you that is going to be writing the story or starting this business or answering these questions? Is it these can take on personal or professional answers. Why am I doing this? Why me? Like if you're addressing imposter syndrome, yeah, you know, that's probably a more personal answer that you're going to want to give to that question. But if I'm asking what's so special about you from the perspective of a buyer or a client or even a community member, that's going to be more of a professional answer because they want to know like, what is it that I'm going to expect? How should I think of you? And why are you the one to talk about it, right? So you have to think about what kind of experience you have, what kind of maybe educational background you have, what kind of clientele you work with. This can take a lot of different forms. You don't, I don't want you to think that you have to have some kind of prestigious background to do anything. Experience, I think, in my opinion, I think it's so much more valuable than credentials, in my own opinion. That might upset people or offend people, but I think that's what people care about the most. It's like you can be a New York Times bestseller, but if you don't know how to talk about how to write a book or something, like it's gonna be a bit harder to click with people, I feel like. Fifth, you need to understand your target audience. And this goes pretty hand in hand with what I was saying about researching your competition. You need to think about who you're gonna target, what attributes they have, how you're gonna access them, and use all three of those things to inform your presentation or the format in which you're presenting your perspective approach, solution, and or story. When you're considering who specifically to target, this is where you're looking at similarities in demographics, in habits, in challenges, in behaviors. It can take a lot of different forms, 
But you want to be as specific as you can because like the old adage goes, there's riches in the niches. In terms of attributes, this is based on that group and their demographic or their habits or behaviors or whatever, what challenges are they facing? What questions do they have? What problems do they need solved in a quick, easy, ready to go, answerable kind of way. And when it comes to how you're gonna access them, you have to consider where do they hang out? Where do they get their content? Where do they get X, Y, Z, whatever's relevant to whatever it is you're doing and be able to access that pool of them in that particular way. So, you know, for example, if you are wanting to target busy working, small service-based businesses in the Boston area who need help with branding, where are they gonna be hanging out? Well, I don't know, they might be getting trademarks. They might be at conferences or networking events or something, I don't know. I'm just, this is just like off the cuff example, but you kind of see what I'm saying. Number six is recognizing that whatever you're doing is going to be part of a bigger idea, assuming that you're wanting to go all in and really do this thing. It's never just about the book. It's never just about the answer. You are using that as almost like a hook or like a piece to kind of, to reel people in and use that to create a deeper movement or experience or relationship of some kind, right? Give people the answers that they're dying to know, the ones that they've been walking through the desert trying to find the oasis that's gonna quench their thirst. Give them what they need and then tell them, okay, now this is what's gonna happen as a result. You're gonna get to this point and then this is gonna be your real problem, right? So you're kind of catching them, reeling them in, giving them what they need in the moment that they need it to the best of your ability and then from there, now that you've kind of answered their most immediate question and you've almost like proved yourself to them, whether in story or solutions or answers or whatever, you can sort of use that as a way to lead them toward wherever it is you're wanting people to go. If it's subscribing to your YouTube, if it's joining your mastermind, if it's becoming a client, whatever it is, it's always going to be a part of something bigger. Whatever you do as a bite-sized nugget or experience or freebie or whatever you want to call it, that is meant to be a part of the larger ecosystem or movement or experience that you're creating. Number seven is probably my favorite, which is that it's harder than it looks. Everyone thinks for whatever reason that they can do one of or all of three things, teach, write a book and start a business. And as someone who is on number three of those three things, I can confirm that there are people who are going to have opinions. People are going to think that they can do it better than you and maybe they can. But like I said at the very beginning, the hardest part is just getting started. And a lot of people can't get past that. And you know, coincidentally, all three of those things are tied together too. You can use those three things, teaching, a concept or whatever, a book or whatever kind of content your audience absorbs and a business. You can use all three of those things to essentially monetize a new or unique idea through a specific type of content that your target audience is going to absorb and will eventually want to pay for. And I think that is probably the most immediate difference between a business and a book is that if you write a book, it's instant credibility. If you're starting a business, that takes a really, really long time of either either outworking your competition, providing some kind of better or more efficient or more unique system or answer or something for whatever it is that you're offering or whatever question that they have and, and just putting in a ton of work very consistently versus a book, it's all very front loaded. If you just get the first draft on paper, there's a lot that you can do with that and you're better set up to finish it. And when you do finish it and it is published and it's ready to buy and people can purchase it off Amazon or wherever, you can say that you're an author or a best-selling author. Like if you have a book in the world, it's instant credit ability to say that you are an author or a best-selling author. Number eight is that very few of these things do well. The ones that you hear about the most, whether book or business, I feel like are kind of the exceptions and I have statistics to prove this. <laughs> The US Bureau of Labor Statistics says that about 45% of businesses fail during the first five years. And the Synergy Whisperer says that out of every 1,000 people who start a book, only 30, 30 actually complete it. Now this isn't to say that what you're doing or what you're wanting to do is worth pursuing, but it does have to mean that you need to consistently show up even if you are the only person in the room that you were showing up for. I think that is probably the mark of consistency consistency and hard work and really being true to your craft or whatever it is that you're wanting to do. Even if it's just yourself, you are proving XYZ to yourself, you're showing up for yourself. Does that still make 
showing up at all worth it in the first place if it's just you because you're gonna have to do a lot of vouching for yourself you're gonna have to work through a lot of your own personal and professional issues too but mostly personal because anything that you're bringing to the table is going to show up in your work I can't tell you I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus I promise but I can't tell you how many people I've worked with and four that didn't know how to communicate or didn't know how to handle critiques or constructive feedback or criticism. There are so many people that think that doing the thing is what really matters, and it is, but it's also the landscape or the context in which you are presenting it, right? So it takes a lot of work to not just do the thing, but also make it sustainable and effective and attractive. This doesn't mean that it's not worth pursuing at all, but it just means that if you truly believe that this is something, you have to prove it to yourself first before there's other people involved, in my opinion. Number nine is that either books or business or both need to benefit someone. Of course it needs to benefit someone. If they're paying for it, they need to get something out of it, whether it's a solution or entertainment or both. And I really like what Stephen King has to say about this. I, there was a quote that I had in mind when I was making my script, but it's, this isn't the exact quote but that I was thinking of, but it's in the same vein. And it's that your stuff starts out being just for you, but once you know what the story is and get it right, it belongs to anyone who wants to read it or criticize it. And I think that's very well said. And that came from his book called On Writing, which I highly recommend reading for anyone who wants to become an author or you know pursue publication. I really liked it. It was genuinely an amazing book and it was sort of like half hybrid guide, half hybrid memoir. So that came from that book. But anything that you do, it starts with you, but it has to end with the person in mind. Well, a book generally starts with you and ends with the reader. And I feel, I'm still new to the business world, but I feel like the business, yes, do what you gotta do, get through season one of kind of playing around with it and experimenting with it, but you always have to have the other person in mind. And whether that's the audience itself as a collective or whether that's the individual, I personally think it's great to define both. You need to be thinking about how is this going to be useful to someone, whether how, how is it going to be worth their time, their energy, their bandwidth, their money, their commitment. I feel like any value has to outweigh the investment, in, in my opinion. If it's a book, it better be worth it in the end. There better be a payoff. And believe me, I read pr plenty of books that I gave hours of my time to that had a very unsatisfying ending. And I personally deem a book's quality by its ending, whether fiction or nonfiction. <laughs> And when it comes to business, you know, it's like, okay, if I pay for this, am I gonna get why? If you have a money back guarantee and it doesn't work out, honor that money back guarantee. If you recognize that whatever you're doing is going to be a financial risk for someone, what's the way that you can alleviate that objection? And we're kind of starting to get more into sales now and I am not very qualified to talk about sales. I know more about it in theory, but that's just what I have to say about that. So you have to consider how it's gonna benefit someone and if it's gonna be better, or at least equivalent to whatever it is that they're inputting. And then finally, number 10, you are playing a long game. Anytime you're starting a book, anytime you're starting a business, this is a long-term commitment that you're making to not only following through with it, but to also continue marketing it. And that's the part that I think catches a lot of people off guard. Um, content creation's another one that I think a lot of people think that they can do, but it's harder than it looks. That's another one that I learned within the past year or two, but either way, you're playing a long game. A book is only new for one year in the eyes of the industry, but your name is gonna be on it for as long as it's in print. Your name, your credibility, your reputation is going to be tied to whatever it is you're putting out there. And you have to think about how that's going to influence your marketing or how that can play into the perception or the kind of experience that you're wanting to provide through whatever it is that you're making. But anything that you make that's worth following through on and showing up for and being consistent with is going to require a long game. And if it ends up being a shorter game, that's fine. At least you can say that you gave it a fair shot, that you were in the arena doing the thing, trying your best and it didn't work out but you learned a lot along the way right whether it works out or it doesn't it's worth treating it in your mind like it's a long-term investment you're planting seeds right with a book with a business whatever maybe it takes off immediately maybe it doesn't but I think patience and consistency are the two virtues that are going to be exercised incredibly heavily especially if we're thinking about those statistics about 
45% of businesses not panning out in the first five years. So that was a lot. I went in depth more than I thought I would with some of those things. So apologies for this video being slightly longer than intended, but I did think it was kind of a cool thing to talk about, to kind of itch the scratch of both authors, writers, readers, and business people and entrepreneurs alike. So there are more similarities than differences when it comes to those two things, I think, and both of them do sort of feed into each other. So if you like this kind of content, consider liking and subscribing. It lets me and others know that this video is worth watching and you got something out of it. Tell me if you found this useful. It's a little bit different from the other stuff that I talk about. I talk a lot about the stuff people don't know about books and the business of books and marketing and stuff like that, but I'm wanting to lean a little bit more into the marketing side of things with books and business. So tell me if this resonated with you or if you felt like you got something out of it. Otherwise, feel free to leave your thoughts down below. I really love getting conversations going with those of you who leave comments. I really do try to answer everyone's stuff. So that's all I got. I hope you got something out of it. And um, yeah, I think that's it. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.